Welcome to The Sandbox with Justin Peters, connecting you to the ideas and tools to improve your life. Now let's go. Hello and welcome into The Sandbox. I'm your host, Justin Peters, and today's guest is Danny Dow. And Danny, ah, man, I really like Danny. He is quite the skill builder, and anyone who has followed me along in my show knows that I love people who enjoy learning new things. Danny's list of competencies include photography, videography, tailor, barber, magic, breakdancing, and multiple languages. And as you'll hear, he learned most of these skills out of a state of boredom. Danny's short life has taken some twists and turns. He was a computer science major turned college dropout. And someone who is the son of an Asian immigrant dad, this gives me a ton of anxiety. His father didn't know that he dropped out of college for two and a half years to pursue photography, but pursue he did. He is now the co-founder and creative director of Renaissance Group, where he does creative strategy and brand imaging for various corporations. In this episode, you'll hear Danny and I discuss how to turn boredom into curiosity, overcoming the fear of other people's opinions, and why you should be asking for what you're worth. I hope you enjoy today's episode with Danny Dow. Danny, my man, welcome into the sandbox. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah, I'm excited for this Uh, conversation. Um, You're a really interesting person. You and I got connected uh, through Brennan Kumasari, actually my uh, 16th episode guest and he connected us because um you're his creative director and and you do his video and his in his photo work and i he's like hey uh danny's looking to be on more podcast i think you should have him on and i was like yeah of course and we connected and uh just had kind of a general talk and i was like i have to have this guy on because i thought i figured oh photo guy like and then i realized you're more than just just a creative mind you're uh very philosophical and you're also interested in a ton of different things you're quite the jack of all trades i mean on top of photo and video which i think take up a lot of time if you want to skill build in that area you're a tailor you know some barber skills you you do magic you're a break dancer you know multiple languages that is so fascinating what is it about the process of learning something new that gets you excited i think it's just a hunger for knowledge at the end of the day the best thing for me is to understand how something is built and how something is designed. And so I really want to learn the ends and out of that facet of that aspect. So let's take something easy as in photography. So I see a lot of photos. I see a lot of pictures out there. And at first, when I first started, I got bored and I looked at these pictures and said, you know, I'd love to learn how to take a decent pictures. So I picked up those uh, Canon power shot, you know, those cameras that you just press the button and it just zooms out the lens. <laughs> it has like four and a half megapixels. And I just started shooting. And then, you know, as you learn more, you kind of realize you fall into what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you think you know so much until you reach at a certain point And then you realize, oh, there's a lot more to where this is coming from. And then as you go down that curve, you start realizing that there's like an infinite knowledge out there and you just want to keep learning and learning and learning. But then at a certain point, you get to a point where you start stagnating because you don't know what you need to learn left or what is there left for you to learn. And so that's why learning something new kind of keeps it so that You can still keep your skills in a certain aspect, yet you can learn something new and kind of experience that that sort of honeymoon phase of starting to understand something Mm -hmm. again. And I think that's why I know so many things in life is because I always kept that sort of honeymoon phase going and starting to pick up new and new stuff. And so the biggest problem with that is that, yes, I am the jack of all trades, but I am also the master of none. (laughs) So this is a big problem when it comes to uh, learning a lot of things is that, yes, you know a lot of things, but you're not really good at any any of them. (laughs) 
Well, that's basically it. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with you. You are quite the jack of all trades, but you do, you are, for, for as young as you are, pretty talented, um, both on the video and the, and the uh, photo side. And, and you're pretty talented with a few other things as well. But uh, going back to the skill building, I love that thought. Um, it's why I like to pursue new skills as well. I love that honeymoon phase that you're talking about. Um, specific to that phase, do you have um, some instruction you can give to people to walk them through how they can approach learning a new skill? I think, I think for sure the easiest way for me to put it is find someone to look to. If you find someone that you sort of idolize or look up to and wish to get to a point, it kind of gives you a milestone to reach from A to Z. Because when you start learning something new and you don't know what there is to learn, it's kind of hard to pick and choose what you need. Yes, you need the basics, but sometimes in the basics, there's some stuff that is just redundant or isn't used anymore. And so by having that one person that you look up to and you really want to achieve that work, I think that once you start learning the new things and you start applying them and you get them like, at the end, like the back of your hand, basically, you know them by heart and you can execute what the person can do. You're at a stage where you know you are either at two stages. One, you just want to learn more and experience more stuff. Or two, you figured out what you like and now you're just going to dig deeper into what you really like. And so it just keeps down, you just keep running down the rabbit hole. It's like, those moments where you're on Wikipedia, you start reading a bunch of articles, <laughs> and then as you start reading, you see like a blue link. You're like, "Oh, that's interesting." So you click on it, and then you click, keep clicking on it, and then 20 pages later, you land on like, uh, "What is the national anthem of Zimbabwe?" And you're like, "Okay, well, this is still interesting." <laughs> and I think that is something that everyone should go through is either find someone is to find someone they idolize at first or they look up to they have a goal it's always important to have a goal when you first learn something because you can jump into things but if you don't really have a milestone to reach you can just ingest words and just it goes through one year and out the other year mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I've learned through um, trying to pick up new skills is I, I totally agree with the with the goal, but also setting like a reachable goal and like a, mm -hmm. a f like in somewhere in the first month to three months. Like I didn't mm -hmm. um, start learning guitar and be like, oh, I want to play this Led Zeppelin song um, like perfectly. It's like no, I want to learn a scale up and down within the first three months. Uh, so I think it's kind of scaling back and learning mm -hmm. some of that piece to it. Um, on the photo side for you, I know we talked about this a little bit. You said you learned, you picked up photography because you were just bored one day. And I, I think that's kind of how you learned a lot of your skills is you're just bored. So how do you, how does someone, yeah. um, how does someone take, develop, um, how does someone develop curiosity out of boredom? Because for most people, I think you, you're bored and you go look to be entertained, usually through TV or, or uh, social media, but, but someone like you you're bored and your instinct is to go learn something new so i think for me and it really depends on certain personality my it's funny because i get bored so quickly i am unable to sit at one spot for a few minutes unless i'm taking coffee and i really want to take a, a breath of fresh air but i can't sit when someone says danny you have a day off go take your day off just sit at home relax on your bed I relax on my bed for an hour, I get up and then I do more work because <laughs> I do not like the feeling of not accomplishing something in life. And to return to your question, it's hard depending on like the personality of a person. I think the first thing you have to look at is willpower and motivation. So the difference is that your willpower is that sort of energy that pushes you to keep moving forward. And it differentiates with a bit with motivation because the motivation is just to get you on your feet to do something. So you need to get motivation and then you need willpower to continue on with that motivation. And a lot of people are lacking either one of them or both of them. 
So for me, I think it's just the first thing to look at is to find something you really enjoy. And that's the reason we wake up so many things. It's because, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I'm friends with a lot of talented people. And sometimes I'm like, wow, I wish I could do something they could do. Or in a more kind of macabre way of saying it, or kind of, I'd say, narcissistic way of doing it, of saying it, is I wish I could do something that nobody else could do. Mm. Or I wish I could do something that nobody else can do like me. And so, you know, I picked up photography. I said, hey, there's a lot of photographers out there. Not a lot of people know video. Actually, I started video first before photography. So I said, oh, I'm going to pick up uh, video because all of my dancer friends are unable to shoot videos. And then as I started picking up, it up videos, I said, hey, a lot of photographer, uh, videographers can't shoot photos. So I picked up photo and then... It just kept going on and then I learned more about suiting and then I said, hey, people who works in fashion don't understand suits. So I learned more about suits. I was like, wait, a lot of menswear people don't know how to style someone from head to toe. And so, you know, I started cutting hair, learning hair. I learned like shoes. I learned everything so I can really style a guy from head to toe. And I really think it's that motivation, that one thing that makes you want to push yourself just a bit more in life mm. that you have to find. So I can't give you the secret recipe because there's nothing really. I think the biggest key is just instead of sitting on your ass all day, just go out, I don't know, pick up a golf club, go swinging, go uh, pick up some new things. And the more you try something, the more you will fall in love with a specific mm. thing. And then eventually you'll branch out. Mm. I totally agree with that. Um, I found through learning skills that whenever I get bored, I would much rather go and do that thing versus like what I used to do in the past of just like jumping on and watching some TV or whatnot. I think the hardest thing is skill building though, at least in the early stages. I mean, in the later stages, once you hit that plateau, it's definitely boredom. It's like it's like hitting that plateau and not seeing mm -hmm. the gains as quickly, I think is the toughest part. But, but early on, I think um, two things really, it's like being too scared uh, of trying to start something, but maybe that comes out of like just the fear of other people's opinions because so many skills mm -hmm. is usually like a public knowledge. Um, first, what do you think of that? And then second, is there something that you love now that uh, a few years ago you thought was scary or hard? So um, the first thing about people's opinion is that, yes, it's very true. Uh, we are conditioned as humans to kind of want the approval of people. It very rare will you see someone who says, and the people who say that I don't care about anyone, I don't care about what people think about me, deep down they're just trying to hide the fact that they're like strong, uh, that they're weak, but they're yeah. kind of putting a front in front, uh, in front of them. But deep down, everyone wants validation, no matter if it's your friends, your families, or just any people on the street. People want validation. That's why when you start picking up a skill and you kind of suck at it, it's really hard on the morale. And that's the reason why I tell every photographer, anyone who wants to start their passion, is that, look, photography is really hard. Starting your own business is really hard. Mm -hmm. But the only thing I will tell you is that it will be a lonely road because no one will be there for you when you need them to be because you don't have a circle right now you don't have the approval of people yeah you could be you could be doing let's say guitar for like 20 years you develop a fan base you develop your musician friends they'll be there for you but when you start picking up guitar and you only know how to play an a string and a d string really crooked <laughs> then at this point it's really hard for you to gain the motivation and it's going to be super lonely and once you get past that loneliness it's like, like the sky's the limit you just keep on pushing you stop really thinking about what people think about you and more along the line of man i really want to re reach that new mouse milestone and i also want to be playing new music or i want to be writing my music or i want to be 
you know, I want to pick up singing too, so I can sing with my music. Mm. And can you remind me the second question already? Yeah, the second question um, was: Was there something that you love to do now that a few years ago you thought was scary or hard? Oh, studio photography. <laughs> Any anything that involves strobes. I saw. I remember the first time I saw this big light, and I said. Oh, that is a cool light. What is it used for? They're like, yeah, it's a high-powered flash. And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. How much is it? Yeah, just this box is or just the light itself is like five grand. And I was like, why would someone need something like that? And now I bought my strobes. They're not five thousand. They're like a thousand <laughs> each, because I don't have. I'm not balling on that amount of money yet, and I don't need something that fancy. But I think it's just because. Studio photography and anything involving artificial light is something that is so technical rather than practice. You you really have to understand your technicalities to be able to do that. Like if you shoot in the sun, someone can be like, "Oh yeah, uh, I don't like the lighting here. Let's just go to the next location." Or, "Or I don't like the lighting. Can you turn a bit to your left so you can have the sun on this side?" "Oh, I don't like the lighting. Let's move into the shade." Oh, uh, can you change this? But when you're shooting, for example, food with artificial light in the dark for three hours, if something doesn't turn out right, that's because all because of you. <laughs> There's no one there to blame. You're the one who controls the light. You're the one who styles the food. So, I think the first, the first thing that really scared me is the fact that it was like. I was on my own. I couldn't. Beginner's luck can't save me. I had to be on top of my game. I had to like use everything. And then the more I learned about the basics, because I had years of practice, but I really never dove my nose into a theory book. So then I dove my nose into theory books, and then I used that theory into practice, and then I started learning more and more. And the more I realized, I said. Oh, now I know why people buy five thousand dollar lights. It's because it makes your life so much easier than the sun. Because <laughs> if the sun doesn't cooperate with you, you gotta wait another twenty minutes, or you gotta wait till sunset. If、mm. the light isn't cooperating with you, you can change the light in the next second, <laughs> or you can change something else. Because everything is at your control, and I think that's the reason why I only shoot pictures of inanimate objects now. So like products. Anything for e-commerce and food, because for one, the lighting and the food, everything is at my control. If something goes wrong, I know it's my fault.、Mm. If you're shooting with a model, for example, and you know she comes by, she said, "Oh, I don't like the picture because my makeup wasn't on point today." There's nothing else you could have done. The model just messed up her makeup. But、mm. and then the second, also the second reason is that food doesn't talk back to you. <laughs> like models, and actually, funny story.、Um, when I used to work at the the bay, because I'm from Canada, if anyone doesn't know the bay, it's kind of like the Macy's of the states, give、okay. or take. And I used to work there. My I always told to my coworker that you know I always talk to myself because I enjoy kind of like being in my mind and like having mentality. And she says. It's okay to talk to yourself. There's just a problem when it answers back. <laughs> and so, every time I I tell that every time I tell people that I like shooting food because it doesn't talk back to me, I always say, "But if it does, there's a problem." And that's the context <laughs> of like what I had to say. <laughs> That, that's that's really funny actually because I know I I heard you talk one time about、uh, how you actually hate people but you're you're someone that I think has great people skills so that really surprised me when I heard that how do you recharge from seeing so many people throughout your day There is a small majority of people who wants to come in contact with you because they want to learn more about you they want to experience being with you and they want to just、um, live. Kind of live life with you and move forward with you. Same thing as Brandon.、Mm -hmm. Brandon kind of saw like what I had and said, "Look, I'm passing all over the how. Good morning, how are you?" And it's like, "What's your passion?"、Mm -hmm. 
And so that's the reason why I love talking to Brendan. And same thing with you too. It's like, you know, we all have these things that we're doing that we're all trying to survive and we go there. Uh, we're trying to push forward. Meanwhile, you have a good majority of the people, they come to you either because they want free photos, they want clout, they want to be on your stories, they, you know, they want to be on your entourage because they can benefit from it. Mm. And the more I get to know a lot of people, the more I meet a lot of that latter category. And it really starts to annoy me. And that's the reason why I said, look, I'm not going to go out of my way to say hi to people anymore. Because if you know who I am and what I do in life, and you know how to approach me, then I will definitely start a conversation with you. Because at the end of the day, I want to have... Brandon says that if you meet, for example, one new person, one significantly new person a day for the next 15 years, uh, for the next 50 years, give or take, I think he said that you would meet around 15,000 people. Mm. And I want those 15,000 people to be people I want to grow with. I want to see them progress in life. I don't want to have that one friend that comes up to me, says, hi, how are you? And then messages me 10 days later. He says, hey, how are you? How's life doing? And that's the reason why I don't like talking too much with people because I love having those deeper conversation with people rather than just that surface, hi, how are you? How's your day? Because you know how my day is. It's posted on my story every day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I enjoyed that about our first conversation too. Like we had like a five minute um, meet and greet, and then uh, for the next thirty minutes, we were deep on some philosophical stuff, and I really enjoyed that. I don't mm -hmm. mind um, maybe different from you. I don't mind having small talk if if I have to have small talk with mm -hmm. people, but I do enjoy really intimate, deep one on one conversations mm -hmm. with people that is a little bit more concrete than uh, talking about the weather or what's happening um, in sports or how their day is going or what they do for work. Uh, it's it's those deeper why questions, those third degree, third degree mm -hmm. questions that I really enjoy diving into. Yeah, and similar to how, let's say if you have a similar opinion than with me, I can continue that conversation and kind of find someone to communicate with. Meanwhile, if you have a very differentiating opinion of me, instead of cutting you but I want to learn more because mm -hmm. I want a lot of my friends hate the fact that I'm very much a devil's advocate. So I'm always defending both sides because I feel that there's always two sides of a story. And so when I talk to people that defends a certain opinion that I disagree with. I was like, look, I'm open for a conversation. Tell me why I want to learn more. And I think it's that why and that sort of, and you pointed it out uh, earlier, that um, curiosity in life, that I just want to learn more about people. Mm. And that's the reason why I appreciate small talk from time to time. Like, you know, I get... I get bored. So when someone hits me up, it's like, hey, how are you? I was like, yeah. And then I just send them, I just send them like a good two paragraph <laughs> chunk of literally every second of my day. And they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. You had a great day. It's like, yeah, okay. But I really <laughs> enjoy those moments when I sit down for like an hour and a half. And just the other day, like my friends and I, we, uh, I have this one friend, she's very into social issues right now and I'm very disconnected to social issues and so we just had this nice conversation where I told her my point of view she told her mine and I got to understand more on the other side of the fence and it made me a bit more empathetic to her cause and I think having conversation in life is the way to grow as people and mm. as just humans in general yeah yeah I totally agree with that um, so taking a left turn here, getting back into the photo side to things, um, what does it mean to you to be a creative? Oof, it's a very uh, tough question. For me to be a creative, I think the best way for me to describe it is that being a creative is being someone who is able to 
showcase how he sees the world hmm. because the world can be seen in so many ways and that person has to flawlessly execute how he perceives the world hmm. and so a musician perceives his his for example relationships through music his friendship through music an artist will paint the world paint her emotions a photographer will capture pictures or basically sh mold a narrative for a picture and i think that the best way basically to to summarize is that a creative is a person who displays his work flawlessly his vision of the world hmm. So, um, you know, taking that concept of a vision and whenever you're working with your clients, how do you think about the creative vision of each of the people that you work with? And so this is, is actually a funny question because I get people ask me a lot, like, how do you incorporate your style and stuff to different customers and different customer base? Mm -hmm. And the simple question is that I don't is, mm. is that I my photography is so niche because I specialize not only in products and food photography but I specialize in shooting in the dark so all my pictures are very dark very contrasty it showcases the beauty of the picture in a dark area so anyone who really wants that picture will come to me to get that feel and so the way which a makes my life easier and two makes me charge a lot more for my work because that's my specialty sure and so a lot of these people they come to me for a specific kind of style and but the thing is that you have to have a conversation with your clients to know yes they want it dark but to which extent and what kind of darkness they want not every darkness is the same a lot of people they look at a black picture like wow this picture is dark but then there's different levels of contrast and how dark you want your picture you can have a you can have a very like nicely exposed picture of just for example a black iphone on a black table with a black keyboard with a black mouse and a black computer screen and it looks really aesthetic it's a dark picture but it's not really dark or you can have a picture of just someone in like a dark alleyway where just his face is like lit up but then everything behind him is completely black sucked into the shadows that's another form of like very dark photography mm. so it's my job to talk to the client and understand basically what they want what kind of darkness what kind of feel they want and then adapt my style to what they are asking for and also by having such expertise in shooting in the dark for such a long time i am also in a position to tell them look i believe in my prof professional opinion that this will be better for you 90% mm. of the time they will accept 10% of the time they will try to rebuttal but then the easiest way to like counter that rebuttal is like I'm just giving you my professional opinion do you want it or not sure and a lot of that 10% immediately shifts back and says okay yes we came to you for a reason hmm. so you, you mentioned um, you can charge a high rate now uh, what what and, and I see that I see this in creatives, especially, but but business owners in general, especially with my girlfriend, I get to see her walk through this this challenge. Um, but can you talk about the story of you building your your rate to where it was? And is it really is the biggest hurdle you think in in you know asking for a higher rate, just having the courage to do it, or do you think it's something else? So I will. I will go through the second part of your question first because okay. it will connect to the story. And I think that the there is two the two biggest reasons and the first one being the biggest and the second being kind of like the secondary reason. The first biggest reason is just the courage to ask. A lot of people are afraid to ask for money 
when money comes into the picture, a lot of people get nervous. A lot mm. of people aren't willing to ask for more. And that's kind of sad because that's how the market should be. You should always be asking for more, the better you become. So let's say, and the thing that made me really understand that concept is that one of the person I really look up to his name is Chris Doe from the future on YouTube. Okay. He's a branding architect at this point. And he gave an analogy or a story and he says, why are you not? So if your friend comes to a client and a client gives a job to your friend and your friend has to give your rates, why is he defending you more than you are defending yourself? So then imagine a client walks up to to me, uh, to my friend and says, hey, I'd love Danny to shoot my pictures. My friend would say, all right, so how? what is your budget? Oh, yeah, so I want a thousand pictures and I'm willing to pay $50. <laughs> then my friend would immediately back off and says, whoa, 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 a thousand pictures. Even if I'm generous, that's at least $10 a picture. You should be paying ten thousand dollars minimum to Danny, and with his skills and expertise, you should be paying at least twenty, thirty k. But then someone says, comes up to a normal creative, is like, "Hey, I want a thousand pictures," and then the creative, who's scared of asking money, he would be, "Oh well, I think that would be three shoots, and um, I think." Within three shoots, I can shoot probably 300 pictures each. And then I would charge maybe 150 per session. And so your total for your budget would be $500. So why is it that your friend is defending you more than you are defending yourself? And that made me think that's like, whoa, okay. I am willing to, because I have a lot of friends who are photographers and people always come to me to ask for specific types of photos and I just refer them to my friend. They say, hey, do you know his, uh, his rates? And I would always shoot a rate that was way higher than what they charge. So when the client walks up to my friend and says, hey, I'm willing to shoot a picture. Uh, I'm willing for, to book a shoot with you. I'm willing to spend a grand. And then my friend just drops his jaw. It's like, whoa, I usually charge 50 for a session. Why is he charging me, asking me for a grand? And so when that feeling kicked in, you kind of understand that it's like there's no shame in asking for more money. If people respect what you do, then they will pay the money. There's a difference between a cl being a client saying that you're too expensive and a client saying that you charge too much. You being too expensive is that they can't afford you. You charging too much is that your value is not based on your price. And I think that is the biggest distinction that a lot of people kind of like mix together is that they think that when someone says, wow, you're expensive, is that their value is doesn't equate to the price they're charging. Hmm. And people have to get past that thing to start charging more. Sure. And now the second biggest thing is they don't know how to. A lot of most photographers don't don't really show their prices most people say hey is uh 50 dollars kind of a good uh good starting base to charge for like an hour session and i was i just looked at them i was like dude how much do you buy your camera for i don't know a thousand how much were your two lenses uh probably two thousand your camera bag uh a hundred dollars your sd card i don't know a hundred dollars a piece and you want to charge him fifty dollars for the hour and they're like, oh, okay, you're making a lot of sense now. So a lot of creatives can't really take their assets and kind of amortize them and then separate them to their time base. Like how much their time is worth based on their assets and their knowledge. Hmm. And I think there's this good story where there's a, um, I read it somewhere, there's like a boat that did not function and so they asked so many people to come in and fix the boat and no one could fix it until they called the, this guy that's been fixing boats for like 50 years. He comes in, smacks a nail on the motor and the boat functions. 
the next day they get an invoice for ten thousand dollars. They said, "Dude, you smacked the nail. That's like a dollar." The guy says, "Yeah, the nail's a dollar, but my knowledge is worth nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars." Hmm. Yeah, I I don't think a lot of people get that concept, and that's really challenging. I think that's maybe one of the biggest leaps from people turning a passion into an actual business or a career. Uh, do you see any other hurdles of people, um, and, and you can stay in the creative space or you can pull from anything you want, but uh, is there any other major hurdles that you often see people struggle with turning what is an interest or a passion into a career or, or a sustaining job for them? I think I think the biggest three things I've seen so far from the creatives that I've really I've sat down and really helped them improve their business. The first one is sustainability. A lot of creatives have a tendency to do a one-off shoot. Yeah, you, if you make a good ten thousand dollar contract, it's okay to do it once. But imagine if instead of doing that ten thousand dollar contract in one year, you can tell them, hey, every season, that's twice a year. When you release a new fall clothing, uh, when a, you release a new line of clothing, how about I charge you four thousand dollars each time we shoot, hmm. and then you improve, go over that. So then the client, he, on one side, he shoots ten thousand dollars. The guy is happy because he made ten grand, and the client's happy because he has pictures. The next year or the next season, he finds a cheaper photographer, or he finds someone who. If he's really happy, he comes back to the same guy. Meanwhile, on the flip side, you have a guy who charges, let's say, four thousand, five thousand dollars per season. He still makes that ten thousand dollars every year, but now every year he still has the same client. And now try to multiply this by, let's say, you shoot for ten fashion brands. They all give you five thousand dollars per season. Oh. Then you realize you're now making more than, let's say, eighty percent of like the people in this world.、Mm -hmm. You're making like six figure digits.、Mm -hmm. And the second thing I've noticed is the concept of a of the specialization. So a lot of people move linearly. So creatives who have a tendency of, and I think it differentiates between different. Really niches. So for photography, it's one thing. For tattoo artists, it's another. For music, it's another too. I'm speaking more for photographers or videographers. Is that they have a tendency to learn something. So let's say you start shooting portraits because every photographer started with portraits or shooting landscape, and then they say, "I want to shoot products, and now I want to shoot food, and now I want to shoot fashion, and now I want to shoot architecture." And now I want to focus more into like close-up corporate events, and they kind of move more in a line. Meanwhile, there's someone else who says, "You know what? I'm really good at portraits. How about I shoot corporate portraits? How about I shoot corporate portraits for the health industry? How about I shoot corporate portrait for the health industry, but I specialize in hospitals?" Now every hospital in Montreal is gonna hear about that guy, and so for every time there's a new doctor on the scene that wants like a corporate headshot, he's gonna contact that guy because、mm. that that guy is specialized into something, and that's why he can charge a lot more. And that's the reason why I gave up on shooting a lot of things in life, even though sometimes it kills me inside to only shoot food. But I just love my job. I don't really care.、Um, I think that allows me to really focus all my effort and all my equipment into shooting what I'm good at. The first guy, yes, he knows a lot of things, and I think all photographers should know the basis of all things. But once you start running left and right like a rabbit and accepting every contract in every domain possible, you can't make a name for yourself. You're just that guy that shoots everything.、Mm -hmm. What makes you different? Than the guy that can do the same thing as you, shooting everything, but for fifty dollars less, or a hundred dollars less. See, now you run into the problem that like everyone can do what you do, they can just cheaper charge a cheaper price. 
doesn't matter what equipment you use. Cameras these days, they come out 26 megapixels, 63 megapixels, all these things. You can buy the most brand new equipment. No one can't, can't tell anything. Fun fact, you know that a billboard on the side of like the road, you know how many pix- megapixels you need to like put a picture on a billboard that wide? Like let's say 27 feet, like a... Like I- a I have no idea. I don't even really have concept of megapixels. <laughs> so school me here. So usually your iPhone, I can't remember how much your iPhone has. My ca- professional camera has 26 megapixels. Most consumer camera has like 16 to 18 megapixel cameras. Mm-hmm. Professional high end looking at 60 to over 100. It takes four megapixels to put an image on a billboard on the side of a highway. <laughs> <laughs> just to give you context because people are so far away from the billboard that they can't see the difference now yeah. uh, contrast that to someone who let's say they shoot a picture they edit it for like an hour they change everything and then they send the picture to you and you look at the picture you're like oh that's really nice actually but then you look at me where i edit the picture for two minutes and then i still send it to you and you're like oh this is really nice too because you can't tell the difference. It takes such a skilled eye. And that's the reason why a lot of, for example, wine tasters can't taste their, in a blind test. They can't make the difference out of really good wine and cheap wine. Because you need to develop that really specific like, taste palette or that like perception to be able to distinguish what's good and what's not. As long as you do your job right and you're really good at it, I think that's a thing. And what's the third Oh, finally, the third point. I'm sorry, I'm rambling a no, lot. No, go for it. I'm like really hyped up on this. <laughs> uh, and I think the last point, which is probably the biggest point, is a lack of people skills. Mm. The amount of people or creatives I have to school when I see them talking to a client, I, I, I kind of get aneurysms from like reading my friends' texts to like their customers. First of all, you don't really text your customers. You always have to have a pay. Oh, no. They, they say, oh, my client told me that he's going to give me $400 for the shoot. I was like, where's the proof? He was like, what do you mean proof? Where's the paper proof? And I was like, uh, I don't have any. So what happens if he sends you $200 and just ghosts you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. And I was like, you always have to have a paper trail. And it's just business practice to have, for example, understanding how to run your business and understanding how to speak with people properly. Hmm. And I I think the speaking part, and that's the reason why I love Brendan so much, is just his speaking is phenomenal. Yeah, it it really is. He's he's top-notch. I really enjoyed him on the show. But uh, we got a couple more minutes here, and I want to I want to dovetail into something else, just because you have such uh, expertise, I think, in, in fashion, and uh, it, you know, you you mentioned uh, dapper, the word dapper, and for anyone that doesn't know that word, they can go look it up. But 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 you're, you're dapper for sure. <laughs> how how Thank many suits? You. How many suits do you have, by the way? I lost count after ten. <laughs> I think I have around like 11 or 12. I, nice. I lost track. <laughs> yeah, I always love looking at your pictures just because I think you look fly. Um, and and I have a, uh, a, I have, I have a male, um, a young male dominated audience. So um, I, I'm going to ask a couple pointed questions to help them out here. You know, for that guy who isn't necessarily confident, like looking or, or like wearing the most trendy things um, that are out there right now, What's what's a couple things they can add to their wardrobe to spice things up? So the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to fashion is not even about the pieces, but it's about just the feeling in general. Mm-hmm. Is no matter what you wear, no matter how trendy it is or not, no one has a right to say if you look good or not. You look good deep inside and that's all that matters and if you can get that through your head you you can wear whatever you want (laughs) and once people understand that i think they can start really gaining that confidence in starting to wear like whatever they want but 
back to your question. And when it comes to wardrobe, the way I like to explain it to my friend is that the best way to start when building your wardrobe is what I call the staple piece or the key piece is to find something that you always wear and then use that as a starting point to build your wardrobe around that piece you always wear. Most people don't realize, but they look at my pictures and I only wear a white shirt. And the reason why is that that white shirt is my key staple, is my key piece, my staple piece. Mm -hmm. And so I build my entire wardrobe over a white shirt. And so like you would never see me rock a white shirt with a white suit because a white suit doesn't go with a white shirt. <laughs> and so actually you start like, you start the way I like to say it is that you start with something either general or specific. So I went with a shirt at first. What can look good in a shirt? A pair of jeans look good in shirt with shirts. A pair of trousers look good with shirts. Bomber jacket, jackets, anything looks good with a shirt. Okay, let's narrow down. White shirt. What looks good in a dress white shirt? Trousers, maybe some jeans, a suit. And so once you start building that key staple, you kind of like build yourself different outfits and different staples. And where you said, hey, I have a blue suit. What can go well with, let's say, the jacket? Oh, how about I buy, buy like beige pants? How about I buy, buy like a pair of um, blue Levi jeans to just go with the jacket so I don't wear out my pants? And then from there, it's like, oh, I really like those pair of pants pants what can i buy with that well you can wear a turtleneck with it you can wear a white t-shirt with a jacket on it you can wear sneakers you can wear stuff and it's to kind of build let's say i'd say build yourself like a sort of tree so you have your key pieces on top and then you start to branch down. What can look good with that? And then what can look good with this? And then what can look good with that? And then at the end, you have a culmination of different outfits. Some people say, oh, I don't have anything. I just have a, a, a blue suit in my wardrobe. And I was like, bro, if I had a three-piece blue suit in my wardrobe, and it's funny because I actually don't have a three-piece blue suit, I should get myself one. I, in my mind, if I think really quickly, I can do 10 outfits with that three piece because I know how to separate every single piece and combine it with other ev everything else. Mm -hmm. And then once you start combining things together, then you start developing that buying habit that's not, oh, this piece is trendy. I want to wear it, but I have nothing goes well in my wardrobe you start buying stuff to complement your wardrobe and you just build up from there. So it avoids you at the end of a season looking back at your wardrobe and saying, yeah, you know those uh, neon pink joggers that was really trendy last <laughs> year? Um, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of that. So let me just throw it out. First, it's going to save you a lot of money and it's going to save you a lot of time in the future yeah. and wardrobe space. Yeah, for sure. What's uh, one, two, maybe three items in your wardrobe right now that cost less than $100 that you absolutely love? That's kind of rough because a lot of things in my wardrobe are mostly custom made, so they're all above $100. <laughs> I but figured so. <laughs> I'd say for the average, I'd say for the average man, and I don't want to knock on Zara, I just don't approve of their business model. That's why sure. I don't buy from Zara. But I understand that a lot of people don't have the budget and a lot of people still want to look nice. I think the biggest thing to have, number one, a pair of white sneakers. Just nice tennis shoes, anything like Stan Smith, AF1s, uh, white New Balances. Just something that you can throw on with jeans. You can throw on with beige khaki pants. You can throw on with a blue suit. You can throw on with shorts. That's going to look good. Mm-hmm. Number two, I would definitely say a good white dress shirt. That is just plain and simple. You can go to any events out there with a plain white shirt and no one will bat an eye. You show up at a casual meeting, you have your shirt tucked out, which I really never do, but if that's your, <laughs> your cup of tea, do it. You can show up to a white, uh, to like a, a business casual event with a suit and a white shirt 
you can show up at a fancy dinner, white shirt, tie or bow tie, whichever you prefer, and a really nice tailored suit, and no one's going to bat an eye. It's really that shirt that goes around with everything. And now, the third item, I would say, really depends on what type of person you are. If you are more of a casual person and you don't like wearing suits, I'd say buy yourself a really good pair of jeans. Mm. Mm. Like something that will last you a while because you don't want to cheap out on a pair of jeans. Yeah. Maybe find something vintage. Maybe go to a thrift store, find like a nice pair of Levi's. Just find yourself a nice pair of jeans that will go well with everything. Hmm. For the casual guy, uh, for the more dressed up guy, and that can also apply to the casual guy, find yourself a really nice overcoat. I know depending on where you live, it might be hot as hell where you live, but where I live, we have winter, I'd say 65% of the time. <laughs> and so having a nice overcoat is a staple that goes with everything because in the fall, you can wear a, your nice, let's say, black overcoat with white pants, uh, with with black pants, white sneakers, a black t-shirt. For winter, you can wear a turtleneck, throw on like a scarf in it to kind of cover yourself up, and then some boots, and you got yourself a nice winter coat. So depending on you are, I think those are three key staples that every guy really needs to have. Mm. Well, I appreciate that advice. Um, if anyone's out there looking for some inspiration, I would encourage them to go and check out your Instagram page. Danny, can you share where people can find you and connect with you? So you can all find me on Instagram at Dapper Cards. So that's D-A-P-P-E-R underscore C-A-R-D-S. I post mostly food and suits because I am a food photographer and I do a lot of menswear and a lot of my photos are very self-deprecating too because I feel that we should laugh at the darkest things in life. Awesome. Um, so you heard him go connect with him. If you have questions, you know, all things photo, fashion, anything, I, you're someone that enjoys having conversation with uh, just about any topic at hand. So my final question for you, Danny, What's a habit that you wish you would have started at 20 years old? This is something I ask um, my guest, and maybe 20 might be too soon for you since you're so young. So if you want to pull back even further to 16 or something, what is something that you wish uh, you would have started a lot earlier than you did? That's a very good question. I think it's just, I just, I think it either has to go along the line of work ethics or really waking up early. Mm. I think those are the main two I kind of regret because I spent, I wasted all of my teenager, my teenage years gaming. Like I was gaming 16 years, uh, 16 days, uh, hours a day. Wow. <laughs> and I kind of wasted all of that. If I knew how to do what I did at 16, I would be bowling right now. But <laughs> you can't, I don't regret anything I've done because it's because of those mistakes and those things that made who I am as a person. Hmm. And so I would never look back on to anything in the past. And yeah. the work ethic part is being on time with everything, being on time with your email responses, showing up on time at meetings, which I always am late at meetings and I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I think that's... Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think that's that's great advice. Um, and I think many of us probably have some regret of probably sleeping in a little bit too late uh, whenever we were teenagers. So Danny, thanks again for coming into the Sandbox. I really appreciate the conversation and, and looking forward to continuing in the future. Definitely, thank you for having me. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If this episode brought value to you, share it with a friend and show love on social. You can tag me at Justin Lee Peters. The link to the show notes is in the episode description and we'll include all the resources we talked about today. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time in the sandbox.